name is Heidi and I'm a mathematician. Um, my goal as a mathematician is to build what is beautiful and what is good. I'm interested in working at the intersection of three different disciplines, mathematics, design, and geography. All of these areas bring their own challenges, their own elegance, their own grace to the solutions they provide. And I think by combining these, there's some really interesting, difficult, beautiful questions to be asked. So for example, one thing that I look at is machine learning. I look at machine learning approaches for remote sensing. So you take satellite imagery and try and, for example, identify all of the cars. Now, once you have this information, you can build beautiful, complex spatial models to understand how the patterns of cars are changing, what that might mean, how we can model it, how we can take this information. Then you can make a beautiful map and communicate it out. So by combining these three disciplines, math, design, geography, we're able to come up with a solution to a difficult question and build something that is beautiful and that is good. So I'm Andrew Krauss. I'm a mathematician at Oxford here. Um, one thing that's been on my mind quite a lot for the past few years are patterns. So a famous physical chemist in the 20th century, Prigogine, said that the world is richer than is possible to express in any language. And mathematicians have been trying to prove him wrong by saying that we can find a way to explain natural patterns, you know, that you, you might see in nature. So the, the classical examples are stripes and spots on animals and things like this, but there are lots of other examples like vegetation patterns or why you have certain geologic formations. And so the thing, the thing that's been on my mind has been this sort of mechanisms of pattern formation. And mathematics gives a very nice way of expressing these ideas in clear language with simple hypotheses. My name is Martin Brideson, I'm a mathematician. I'm also president of the Clay Mathematics Institute, which means I spend a lot of my time trying to create other opportunities and incentives for other people to do great mathematics. What I really love is doing my own research, and for me that's mostly in geometric group theory. Um, so groups are the mathematical objects that describe symmetry in any context across mathematics and science. They're fantastically subtle and beguiling objects, very difficult to understand. And a lot of what I try to do is try to realize these abstract objects as symmetries of new geometric structures so that you can then use the intuition and the power of geometry to solve what might otherwise be intractable algebraic problems. Hi, my name is James. I'm the admissions coordinator for maths at Oxford, and I'm a mathematician. Um, I've been thinking about how we can put more maths into our admissions process. Um, as part of the process, everyone sits this thing called the mathematics admissions test. Uh, and it's got a very limited syllabus of maths that we expect people to have seen by the time that they sit the test. Um, but this year we've tried to put in questions that foreshadow things that people might learn at university. There was a question uh, that secretly the Catalan numbers in disguise, uh, and there was another question on something called Pollard's Row Algorithm. And we're, we're not expecting applicants to know those things or recognise them when they do the questions. Um, but I hope that they can look back on the questions afterwards, maybe years later, uh, and realise that they were doing some pretty advanced mathematics during that test. Hi, I'm Mel, and what's currently on my mind is the problem of finding groupings or clusterings within databases. So why might you want to do this? Well, if, say, you're Amazon and that database is uh, the interactions between people buying products, you might want to identify groupings of people that buy similar products so you can um, make predictions of future, um, future purchases. Or if you're working in medicine, uh, you might be interested in chemicals that have similar properties or um, genes that have similar profiles. Uh, and it turns out if you try and solve the problem directly, um, it's an optimization problem that is very difficult to solve. And as your database grows, the time that it takes grows a lot as well. Um, but you can approximate it. And I'm currently trying to work on how does your approximation um, relate to the optimal solution that you're after. I guess what's on my mind are applications of probability theory to matrices, that is to collections of numbers. And these matrices may appear in many contexts. Uh, for example, there may be matrices describing uh, correlations in data sets, financial data, uh, agricultural data. They may be matrices describing the allowed energies of complex quantum systems. But what really excites me is the fact that the phenomena one sees in random matrices appear as well in areas of mathematics where we know of no matrices being present. 
So for example, in the zeros of the Riemann zeta function and in the distribution of uh, parked cars in London and in bus arrival times in the city of Cuernavaca in Mexico. This is highly surprising and it's very much on my mind to explain why that might be the case. Hi, I'm a mathematician and we mathematicians tend to have lots of international collaborators, lots of travels. Um, until two or three years ago, I used to go to an average of three, four, five, sometimes six international conferences, travel to North America, China, you name it. Um, but in a world of climate change, um, we really have a responsibility to change this um, way of doing our business. And so what I thought and what I actually did is do a conference different from um, what people usually do. Instead of having everyone from around the world go to one location, make it be two locations, one in Europe, one in North America, so that people can go to the closest one of them and thus mitigate a little bit um, the effect of, of their travels, of, of all these airplanes that they take, and also raise awareness. So I'm going to describe a link between population dynamics and big data. I'd like you to imagine an ant that lives on a stick. And now this ant just moves completely at random left and right. And if it ever reaches the end of the stick, unfortunately it just falls off and that's the end. But just by chance, you might find an ant that happened to survive for a very long time, just through random movements that just didn't happen to die. And in this case, actually, these ants would exhibit a kind of stationarity, a kind of equilibrium. And because they didn't fall off, they would spend most of their time in the middle. But because this equilibrium is conditional on not having reached the end of the stick, this is what probabilists call quasi-stationarity. And it turns out this notion of quasi-stationarity has been used to deal with big data problems in statistics. And in fact, this underpins a new class of algorithms which are there to deal with situations where you have vast quantities of data coming in, perhaps from your smartphone or through the internet. And it turns out this very abstract notion which came from population dynamics is integral to these new modern statistical algorithms to deal with big data. Although my detailed work is in mathematics, I'm also very interested in physical things. And in particular, I've worked on black holes. And one of the implications of black holes is that according to Stephen Hawking, they eventually evaporate away. Now, these black holes are expected to get enormously large. And almost an entire cluster of galaxies will get swallowed up eventually by a black hole. And then this will evaporate away. Now, this evaporation is something that you might expect never to see. But you could see it if it was in an eon, as I call it, prior to ours. And the theory I've been working on has such a thing that the black holes in that previous eon actually create signals that we seem to be seeing. We seem to be seeing these signals with 99.98% confidence. They would be slight warming up of the cosmic microwave background in certain regions, about eight times the diameter of the moon. I'm Jess, I'm a third year undergrad and I've got a lot on my mind. One thing that's on my mind quite a lot is quite literally the mind. I don't know about you, but I love thinking about thinking because we spend most of our lives thinking, so understanding how the brain works is just very exciting. But it's not just exciting, it's also very useful, especially when you start to combine it with maths. So for example, you can use maths to make a mathematical model of brain, and this could help you um, understand better brain diseases or brain disorders so you could get treatments for them in the future. And flipping it around, you can also use understanding about how the brain works to help inform algorithms for machine learning. How exciting! I've also been thinking about drones because last time I did a research project in the Mass Institute looking at using path signatures and some machine learning to detect drones. So I've been thinking about how drones might affect our future. And outside of maths, because I don't just think about maths, I've also been thinking about roller skating because I've just set up Oxford University Roller Skating Club. I'm Beth, I'm a third year undergraduate and I've been thinking about ways to help school students who are stuck on a maths problem. So this term I'm taking a maths education module and so I get to help teach in the school once a week. And yesterday I was in a year nine class and I was listening to a conversation between two students. They were debating what the surface area of this cuboid is. Um, both of them were convinced that four sides of the cuboid had the same area, but they couldn't agree on which four. So they asked me which one of them was correct. Well, in fact, neither of them were correct. No four sides of this 
this shape have the same area? So I was in a tricky position because I didn't want to give them the correct answer. I wanted to help them discover the correct answer. So at the, on the spot, what I did was I got them to try and draw the net of the cuboid and see if this helped them. And it did help them, but I'm not sure if this was the best approach. So I'm still thinking about this. What is the best way to help school students who are stuck on a maths problem? Hi, my name is Matt and I'm a mathematician. And what's currently on my mind is splashing, which isn't as silly as it sounds because it has many industrial applications, anything from a ship slamming into the ocean over a wave or your inkjet printer in your office that you're getting a document for a, for a meeting. So one of the beautiful things about the maths of splashing is that even though these are vastly different problems, the maths underlying it is essentially the same. Uh, but nonetheless, it's still quite complicated, it's not happening very quickly over very short length scales. Um, so it's hard to design experiments or simulations to capture what's going on. So my job as a mathematical modeler is to look at simpler models where we can predict various aspects of the flow to design better experiments or simulations so we can capture what we want to understand. So if I'm building an inkjet printer, I want to reduce the amount of ink that's lost in a printing exercise so I can reduce my costs, and that's what I look at. Hello everybody, my name is Pete Grindrod. I've been thinking a lot about the interface between mathematics and policy that's government policy at all levels of government. Traditionally, mathematics has been in the areas of modelling and therefore sort of operational questions. But increasingly, mathematics has been drawn into uh, uh, information that uh, supports government policy of all times. We were thinking about this earlier on at the beginning of the year and we set up a conference for PhD students from many different universities to come together and hear stories about mathematicians and mathematical research uh, supporting policy. Uh, what terrible lessons we've learned about all of this during COVID. This is the thing, it's a new interface for mathematics and applied mathematics in particular and it's something that I'd like as many, many people as possible to join in with.